This week's video is sponsored by Addy. Uh, Addy is a real estate investment platform here in Canada, which uh, you know I'm a personally a huge supporter of. Uh, I'm not tied to them in any financial capacity, but I certainly like to you know promote what they're doing because I think that they're doing some good in this world. Uh, basically, what they've done is they've democratized the real estate real estate investing. Uh, you know, investments that were typically only available to high net worth individuals, they have basically democratized that and made it available to retail participants. So for example, uh, if you want to invest in multifamily projects with, you know, a partner that has 20 years experience, like you typically had to have a high net worth to, to do that, a minimum investment of, you know, dollars $100,000, $150,000. Uh, same thing if you want to do invest in ground up real estate development. Yes, there's some more risk in that, but you typically needed to have a certain net worth. Uh, but so Addy has basically gone out and they have sourced all these contacts. They've made relationships with all these GCs in the industry where basically they are making these uh, real, real estate properties available to the average person. You can invest in as little as $1 and you can invest as upwards of $1,500. So basically you can create almost a diversified portfolio then of real estate projects uh, throughout Canada. So for example, uh, I just personally invested uh, in, in a deal uh, with them in Mission BC where it's a ground up apartment development uh, that will ultimately be a purpose built rental building and so, you know, you invest alongside, uh, you know, uh, a developer that has significant experience, you know, that's a, yes, it's a four year process and you get paid out once that building is complete. So highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, I wouldn't be supporting it if I didn't believe in it. So um, check out Addy. Hey, Steve Sretzky here. As always, Canadian real estate market update with a particular focus on Vancouver. If you get any sort of value or entertainment out of these videos, all I ask you hit thumbs up and subscribe. Questions, comments, put those below. Uh, I want to touch this week's video on sort of getting back to the larger macro picture. So last week we did a deep dive analysis on the Canadian housing market, uh, which is again, that's certainly my specialty. But I think that you know, as, as anyone that's paid attention to this channel, uh, you know, we certainly like to, to emphasize that you know, Canada is just a very small piece of the pie and we are heavily influenced by what happens you know, around the world and particularly to our, you know, our, from our neighbors to the south. Uh, and so, you know, when we look at all the, the, these moving pieces, um, you know, the Americans and what happens in the U.S. is incredibly important uh, to Canada and in influencing Canadian policy. So, for example, you know, the Fed, the U.S. Federal Reserve, the U.S.'s central bank, uh, you know, they basically dictate what the Bank of Canada does or will do. So it's incredibly important to understand, you know, the, the U.S. and the Fed. And so one of the things I want to point out is, um, there's a really good piece that was put out by Luke Groman, uh, who I heavily respect in the finance space. And so he posted this chart where, you know, basically shows that the top 5% of Americans, the top 5% of, of that society pays or is responsible for 60% of the government's tax revenue. So 5% of the population pays 60% of all the government tax revenues. Um, so obviously that cohort is very important to the government, uh, but what you know when you start to analyze a little bit further, you start to realize that you know those top five percent of people, are typically high net worth individuals, a lot of high net worth individuals don't actually earn a lot of their compensation through you know salaries. A lot of them are earning it through stock based compensation. A lot of them have uh, their wealth derived in the stock market. So it's a very important political uh, tool almost for, for the government, right? I mean, if the stock market is up, people feel good, they spend more money, uh, that cr then creates incremental tax revenues. So what he argues basically is that, okay, so if this top 5% of people are paying, you know, the majority of the taxes, um, you know, it's, it's certainly in that cohort's best interest and the government's best interest to ensure that, you know, the stock market, for example, uh, does well. And so his argument is that while it would certainly be nice uh, or maybe, maybe the right thing to do for all of society is, you know, hey, if inflation gets taken off or asset prices get too bubbly, we raise interest rates. But his view is that 
you have a scenario where, okay, if you start raising interest rates and yields start backing up, what does that mean? Well, the stock market is going to sell off. Uh, you know, higher interest costs on corporations, you know, obviously that cramps earnings, stocks, again, sell off. So his view is that this has become, the U.S. stock market is essentially um, a means of national security to ensure that valuations and to ensure that the stock market continues to go up and to the right is a matter of national security. And I think what we can actually see is that every time the stock market starts to sell off, what happens? The Fed comes in, cuts interest rates. So you can remember in 2018, right? The Fed started hiking interest rates, uh, saying, hey, listen, you know, like we're gonna, we're gonna normalize interest rates. We're gonna show you. And then the market sold off 20%. The Fed instantly reversed course, cut interest rates, brought back QE. Um, and then what happened in, at the onset of the pandemic, right? We started to see the stock market selling off every single day down three, four, five percent you know, markets and turmoil headlines coming out. And what did the Fed do? Well, they started, you know, cutting interest rates, un backing up the truck, massive amounts of QE. Uh, they brought in, uh, you know, corporate bond purchases, which under the Fed's oath or under their regulations was actually illegal. But of course, you know, hey, let's make some changes to that. Let's do it this way. And all of a sudden, they're buying corporate debt. And so he, you know, argues that, and I certainly believe that, you know, the next time the markets sell off significantly, uh, at some point down the road, you will probably see, similar to what's happening in Japan, is you'll see the central bank in the U.S. They'll start to buy equities. So you'll probably see the Fed artificially support that market. And so. You know, why do, I, why do I say this all? Because I think it all comes in together. Now, if we look at, for example, uh, we also have, ha there's a good piece out from Larry McDonald of Bear Traps Report where he points out that the U.S., the U.S. 10-year treasury, for example, which is right now is at about 1.2%, if that goes to 3%, the federal government's budget deficit in the in the U.S. basically about 100% of it will go towards servicing its interest costs, as serving as interest payments. So the, the federal government will essentially go bankrupt if you have this backup or normalization in yields. So you can start to see the dilemma. It's not that. It's not that inflation won't increase and continue to increase and it's not that they shouldn't do the right thing the fed should naturally you would think would raise interest rates but the thing is that the system can actually support it so we're gonna get i don't know how this all plays out but at some point you're gonna get to this crossroads where inflation is going to be running hot they're going to want to, need to, or try to raise interest rates. But you have the two scenarios which I just outlined to you. And so that's where we run into these problems. And it's the same thing here in Canada. I think that instead of the stock market, because let, let's be honest, does any Canadian actually care about the TSX? I never hear anyone in Canada talk about the TSX. What they talk about is pre-sale condos, real estate. Hey, I've got three condos. I got four condos. Everybody here is obsessed with real estate. So our version in Canada of the U.S. stock market is real estate. We obsess over real estate. The Canadian government implicitly supports real estate. There's basically a backstop against the real estate market. So every time the real estate market starts to slow or wobble, the Canadian government comes, comes in with some sort of policy change to try to stimulate the housing market. So despite what they talk about with housing affordability and, oh, don't worry, we're gonna rein this in. Again, it's all, it's all talk. It's similar, to the, it's similar to, the, to, the, to, the, to the bullshit talk that the Fed says, oh, hey, if inflation starts to take off, don't worry, we'll start raising interest rates. We're, we're, we're watching it, we're watching, but we're not actually doing anything. And so, you know, what has been, for example, we see is what has been the Fed's, uh, you know, the, the Fed with, you know, inflation starting to take off. What, what, what has been the answer? We've seen the balance sheet increase. Uh, you know, you, as of today, you know, the Fed, 
the US Fed owns 45% of the mortgage backed security market. Um, so, you know, voila, now how did you get such low, how did you get such low uh, mortgage rates in the United States? Why is the housing market up in the US? Prices are accelerating at, at their fastest pace, um, faster than they were accelerate, accelerating uh, during the great financial crisis, uh, which happened in 2008. Well, I mean, the, the Fed is buying hand over fist these mortgage-backed securities. I mean, again, supplying that liquidity, the banks are lending, people are borrowing, the, the Fed owns 45% of the MBS market, times are good. Uh, not only that, but you know, you can see, so inflation starts taking off here, all of a sudden, the, the Fed has now purchased the single largest uh, purchase ever into the TIPS market, the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So they're basically uh, inflation, uh, they're basically inflation assets, right? So if you are bullish or you think that you're gonna have an inflationary scare, you know, you go in and you buy TIPS. But so what, why, now you have to start to question, well, why is the Fed starting to buy TIPS? Why would they start to aggressively buy TIPS? Is it because they want to control the inflation narrative? Is it because they, they want to control the TIPS market? Um, and, and so these markets are all heavily manipulated. And so my view again, now when I tie this all together, and people say, well, Steve, what's your view? I don't understand. Like you say, you're, you know, you're bullish on, on, on assets or on real estate or whatever. It's just that you can see this manipulation in, it's, it's happening right in front of you. Um, and so what I think is we're gonna enter into this period that between what we saw back in the day was, you know, between 1945 and 1955, you had basically, uh, you know, treasuries capped at about 2% and inflation running at about upwards of 10%. So you had these deep, deep, uh, real. Uh, sorry, I think inflation was around five percent, but you had this deep, deep, you know, negative, real negative interest rates, right? Uh, you know, yield yields at two percent, but inflation running at five. That's a real negative three percent rate, and that's kind of where we're at today. And everybody's saying, "Oh, rates are going up, rates are going up, rates are going up," but it's such a, it's a, it's a completely manipulated market. And that's what we just saw this past week. You know, yields again selling off despite all this scare about inflation, despite CPI coming in at four, four and a half percent, what's happening? Well, yield, yields are actually falling. So you, now we have these really deep, really deep negative interest rates, and they're gonna try to prolong that as long as they can. They're gonna try to get away with it as long as they can, because again, we're in the scenario where you have too much debt, the federal government is too loaded up on debt, that, if you just start normalizing interest rates, you will bankrupt your own government. So the government, which basically controls the central bank, even though they're independent, they control each other. They talk to each other all the time. They are making the decisions. So they're not going to willingly say, hey, guys, yeah, just keep, keep pushing it up. Stop doing QE. Uh, like who, who's, the, who's the buyer of the federal government's debt issuance? It's the central banks, they're buying it all. So these two become one. And so that is, that is kind of the, the main, you know, objective that I'm trying to elicit to you here today is that when you start to understand these systems and you, you create an ability, like the whole point of this channel is not for me to tell you what's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen. All I know is that I, I'm, I understand the system well enough to see that you, you are able to filter out what the government says versus what they do. And you create an ability to think for yourself. That is the most valuable uh, asset and that's something that I certainly hope uh, I can help with in any way possible. The, the, the purpose of this channel is to, to help people think for themselves. And so that that's kind of the path that we're on. So they're gonna try essentially to keep this going for as long as possible um, because that's the only solution. At some point, rubber is gonna meet the road. You're gonna have too much inflation, too low of interest rates. Is that gonna be enough? Do we have enough economic growth 
where we can actually meaningfully sustain higher interest rates. And I want you to take that with you as we move forward, um, you know, coming up into the fall here in Canada, where you're probably going to see, you know, uh, new federal elections, um, some of these housing policies that are coming out, gov what governments are talking about. So, for example, for example, let me just say this before you wrap this up. Uh, I was looking at um, someone sent me the report for the uh, you know the on the NDP government for Ontario. So you know they've made this big PDF deck, this proposal for their sort of housing policy platform in Ontario, and one of them was they want to help first-time home buyers. Who doesn't? It's such a nice thing to help first-time home buyers. Doesn't, doesn't that feel good? Doesn't that buy you votes? Um, and so what they said is, listen, we're going to do an equity sharing program. We'll help uh, purchase. We'll take a 10% equity stake in your home. So we'll help you with the down payment. And, and as a result of helping you with the down payment, we get an equity stake in your home. The thing is, the federal government already has that program through CMHC. So the federal government today, under, under Trudeau, this was brought in about a year, year and a half ago, the federal government will take an equity stake in your home of 5 to 10%. So by them basically helping you with the down payment, the federal government says, listen, because we're helping you with the down payment, we get to take an equity stake. So when you go to sell in eight years and there's a little bit of a profit there, we're going to take you know, our portion of that profit and that will basically offset the loan that we gave you. So, so the federal government saying, listen, we'll go, we'll go up to 10%. And then you've got the NDP coming in in Ontario saying, well, we'll go 10% too. So now the government owns 20% of your house. Isn't that great? Um, but who, who does that help? If you just start handing out money that ultimately gets funneled back into the housing market. So listen, like, there's an unlimited amount of money that the government can give to support the housing. It's like that actually ends up enriching the existing homeowners. That's actually going to end up pushing the prices even higher. If the government starts saying, hey, you know what? We'll own 20%, 30%. Why not 50%? We'll own the house 50-50 with you. Well, where's that money coming from? It's just going back into the housing market. Just gonna, it just pushes the prices even higher. So... These are the kind of programs that unfortunately there's going to be a large cohort of society that looks at this and says, this is fantastic. I can't get into the housing market. The government is promising to partner, uh, you know, JV with me on this real estate venture uh, that why don't I go and vote for them? Not knowing that they're actually just screwing themselves. Um, so again, that's kind of the whole purpose of the channel is to really understand the, the bigger picture once you understand the framework that the government is along for the ride, that the government is in for this, that in the U.S. the stock market is a political tool that is of basically national security, that it needs to continue to go up and to the right over time, and that the, in Canada, the housing market is a political tool that derives the majority of the wealth in the country. That, you know, when 65% roughly of your GDP is derived from um, consumer spending, the chances are likely that people will spend more. I mean, the, the research is there. People spend more when they feel wealthier. And if your house continues to go up and to the right, Typically speaking, you're going to feel wealthier. You have more uh, capital to tap into, refinance your home, go buy a boat. That goes up and to the right. So the government is playing along with it. Now think about, again, you've got the federal government, you know, JT, Justin Trudeau, how, how you know, running massive budget deficits. I mean, how, how's the guy paying for it? Well, he doesn't. He basically just issues a bond, which the central bank, the Bank of Canada, basically buys, yes, in the secondary market, but they basically buy that debt. So they're funding his deficit. Now, his deficits are only possible. Like, go look at their models. 
their models today. Like, listen, we're borrowing, we're spending all this money because the interest payments have never been lower. We're borrowing, you know, we're the federal government, we're borrowing at 1%. So what happens, you know, if, the, if, if they're not borrowing at 1% in 12 months, they're borrowing at three. Well, they won't be able to service their interest payments. So they, they are inclined. So unless you think that the federal governments, not only in Canada, but in the US, are gonna willingly bankrupt themselves, then, you, you know, that, that bet on basically low rates is essentially that everybody is in the same boat. We're all singing Kumbaya together that when one goes down, we're all going to go down. So, I mean, if the federal government, you know, <laughs> defaults on their interest payments, uh, guess what? I mean, all hell is going to break loose. It's not going to matter if you have any debt or not. So it's just, it's just this whole uh, chess game. Uh, that I hope uh, is, I've helped explain it uh, in this week's video. But as always, hope that helped. We'll see you next week.